Battle of Midway, Wikipedia article audio Pacific Fleet Combined Fleet Background Yamamoto's Plan, Operation MI Southeast Asia Burma Southwest Pacific North America Japan Aleutian Invasion Manchuria The Battle of Midway was a decisive naval battle in the Pacific theater of World War II which occurred between 4 and June 7, 1942, only six months after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and one month after the Battle of the Coral Sea. The United States Navy under Admirals Chester Nimitz, Frank Jack Fletcher, and Raymond A. Spruance defeated an attacking fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy under Admirals Isoroku Yamamoto, Chuichi Nagamo, and Nobutake Kondo near Midway Atoll, inflicting devastating damage on the Japanese fleet that proved irreparable. Military historian John Keegan called it the most stunning and decisive blow in the history of naval warfare. Prelude the Japanese operation, like the earlier attack on Pearl Harbor, sought to eliminate the United States as a strategic power in the Pacific, thereby giving Japan a free hand in establishing its greater East Asia CO prosperity sphere. The Japanese hoped another demoralizing defeat would force the U.S. to capitulate in the Pacific War and thus ensure Japanese dominance in the Pacific. Luring the American aircraft carriers into a trap and occupying Midway was part of an overall barrier strategy to extend Japan's defensive perimeter, in response to the Doolittle air raid on Tokyo. This operation was also considered preparatory for further attacks against Fiji, Samoa, and Hawaii itself. The plan was handicapped by faulty Japanese assumptions of the American reaction and poor initial dispositions. Most significantly, American cryptographers were able to determine the date and location of the planned attack, enabling the forewarned U.S. Navy to prepare its own ambush. There were seven aircraft carriers involved in the battle and all four of Japan's large aircraft carriers Akaji, Kaga, Saryu, and Hiryu, part of the six-carrier force that had attacked Pearl Harbor six months earlier and a heavy cruiser were sunk, while the U.S. lost only the carrier Yorktown and a destroyer. After Midway and the exhausting attrition of the Solomon Islands campaign, Japan's capacity to replace its losses in materiel and men rapidly became insufficient to cope with mounting casualties, while the United States' massive industrial and training capabilities made losses far easier to replace. The Battle of Midway, along with the Guadalcanal Campaign, is widely considered a turning point in the Pacific War. American Reinforcements after expanding the war in the Pacific to include Western outposts, the Japanese Empire had attained its initial strategic goals quickly, taking the Philippines, Malaya, Singapore, and the Dutch East Indies, the latter, with its vital oil resources, was particularly important to Japan. Because of this, Preliminary planning for a second phase of operations commenced as early as January 1942. Japanese Shortcomings There were strategic disagreements between the Imperial Army and Imperial Navy, and infighting between the Navy's GHQ and Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto's combined fleet, and a follow-up strategy was not formed until April 1942. Admiral Yamamoto finally succeeded in winning the bureaucratic struggle with a thinly veiled threat to resign, after which his plan for the Central Pacific was adopted. Allied Code Breaking Yamamoto's primary strategic goal was the elimination of America's carrier forces, which he regarded as the principal threat to the overall Pacific campaign. <laughs>
This concern was acutely heightened by the Doolittle Raid on April 18, 1942, in which 16 U.S. Army Air Forces B-25 Mitchell bombers launched from USS Hornet bombed targets in Tokyo and several other Japanese cities. The raid, while militarily insignificant, was a shock to the Japanese and showed the existence of a gap in the defenses around the Japanese home islands as well as the accessibility of Japanese territory to American bombers. This, and other successful hit-and-run raids by American carriers in the South Pacific, showed that they were still a threat, although seemingly reluctant to be drawn into an all-out battle. Yamamoto reasoned that another air attack on the main U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor would induce all of the American fleet to sail out to fight, including the carriers. However, considering the increased strength of American land-based air power on the Hawaiian Islands since the December 7 attack the previous year, he judged that it was now too risky to attack Pearl Harbor directly. Battle Instead, Yamamoto selected Midway, a tiny atoll at the extreme northwest end of the Hawaiian island chain, approximately 1,300 miles from Oahu. This meant that Midway was outside the effective range of almost all of the American aircraft stationed on the main Hawaiian islands. Midway was not especially important in the larger scheme of Japan's intentions, but the Japanese felt the Americans would consider Midway a vital outpost of Pearl Harbor and would therefore be compelled to defend it vigorously. The U.S. did consider Midway vital, after the battle, establishment of a U.S. submarine base on Midway allowed submarines operating from Pearl Harbor to refuel and reprovision, extending their radius of operations by 1,200 miles. In addition to serving as a seaplane base, Midway's airstrips also served as a forward staging point for bomber attacks on Wake Island. Typical of Japanese naval planning during World War II, Yamamoto's battle plan for taking Midway was exceedingly complex. It required the careful and timely coordination of multiple battle groups over hundreds of miles of open sea. His design was also predicated on optimistic intelligence suggesting that USS Enterprise and USS Hornet, forming Task Force 16, were the only carriers available to the U.S. Pacific Fleet. During the Battle of the Coral Sea one month earlier, USS Lexington had been sunk and USS Yorktown suffered considerable damage such that the Japanese believed she too had been lost. However, following hasty repairs at Pearl Harbor, Yorktown sortied and would go on to play a critical role in the discovery and eventual destruction of the Japanese fleet carriers at Midway. Finally, much of Yamamoto's planning, coinciding with the general feeling among the Japanese leadership at the time, was based on a gross misjudgment of American morale which was believed to be debilitated from the string of Japanese victories in the preceding months. Yamamoto felt deception would be required to lure the U.S. fleet into a fatally compromised situation. To this end, he dispersed his forces so that their full extent would be concealed from the Americans prior to battle. Critically, Yamamoto's supporting battleships and cruisers trailed Vice Admiral Shishi Nagamo's carrier force by several hundred miles. They were intended to come up and destroy whatever elements of the U.S. fleet might come to Midway's defense once Nagamo's carriers had weakened them sufficiently for a daylight gun battle. This tactic was typical of the battle doctrine of most major navies at the time. What Yamamoto did not know was that the U.S. had broken the main Japanese naval code, divulging many details of his plan to the enemy. His emphasis on dispersal also meant none of his formations were in a position to support each other. For instance, despite the fact that Nagamo's carriers were expected to carry out strikes against Midway and bear the brunt of American counterattacks, 
the only warships in his fleet larger than the screening force of 12 destroyers were two Kong-class fast battleships, two heavy cruisers, and one light cruiser. By contrast, Yamamoto and Kondo had between them two light carriers, five battleships, four heavy cruisers, and two light cruisers, none of which would see action at Midway. The light carriers of the trailing forces and Yamamoto's three battleships were unable to keep pace with the carriers of the Kido Butai and so could not have sailed in company with them. The distance between Yamamoto and Kondo's forces and Nagamo's carriers had grave implications during the battle, the invaluable reconnaissance capability of the scout planes carried by the cruisers and carriers, as well as the additional anti-aircraft capability of the cruisers and the other two battleships of the Kong class in the trailing forces, was denied to Nagamo. In order to obtain support from the Imperial Japanese Army for the Midway operation, the Imperial Japanese Navy agreed to support their invasion of the Aleutian Islands. The IJA wished to occupy the Western Aleutians to place the Japanese home islands out of range of U.S. land-based bombers based in Alaska. The Japanese operations in the Aleutian Islands removed yet more ships that could otherwise have augmented the force striking Midway. Whereas many earlier historical accounts considered the Aleutians' operation as a feint to draw American forces away, early 21st century research has suggested that AL was intended to be launched simultaneously with the attack on Midway. A one-day delay in the sailing of Nagamo's task force resulted in Operation AL beginning a day before the Midway attack. Order of Battle To do battle with an enemy expected to muster four or five carriers, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief, Pacific Ocean Areas, needed every available U.S. flight deck. He already had Vice Admiral William Halsey's two carrier task force at hand, though Halsey was stricken with severe dermatitis and had to be replaced by Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, Halsey's escort commander. Nimitz also hurriedly recalled Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher's task force, including the carrier Yorktown, from the Southwest Pacific area. Initial air attacks Despite estimates that Yorktown, damaged in the Battle of the Coral Sea, would require several months of repairs at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, her elevators were intact and her flight deck largely so. The Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard worked around the clock, and in 72 hours she was restored to a battle-ready state judged good enough for two or three weeks of operations, as Nimitz required. Her flight deck was patched, and whole sections of internal frames were cut out and replaced. Repairs continued even as she sortied, with work crews from the repair ship USS Vestal, herself damaged in the attack on Pearl Harbor six months earlier, still aboard. Task Force 16 Task Force 17, Midway Garrison Yorktown's partially depleted air group was rebuilt using whatever planes and pilots could be found. Scouting 5 was replaced with bombing 3 from USS Saratoga. Torpedo 5 was also replaced by Torpedo 3 also Fighting 3 was reconstituted to replace VF-42 with 16 pilots from VF-42 and 11 pilots from VF-3 with Lt. Commander John S. Jimmy Thatch in command. Some of the aircrew were inexperienced, which may have contributed to an accident in which Thatch's executive officer LTCMNDR Donald Lovelace was killed. Despite efforts to get Saratoga ready for the coming engagement, the need to resupply and assemble sufficient escorts meant she was not able to reach Midway until after the battle. On Midway by June 4 the USN had stationed four squadrons of PBY's 31 aircraft in total for long-range reconnaissance duties, 
and six brand new Grumman TBF Avengers, the latter a detachment from Hornet SVT-8. The Marine Corps stationed 19 Douglas SBD Dauntless, 7 F4 F3 Wildcats, 17 Vought SB2U Vindicators, and 21 Brewster F2A Buffaloes. The USAF contributed a squadron of 17 B-17 Flying Fortresses and 4 Martin B-26 Marauders equipped with torpedoes, in total 126 aircraft. Although the F-2AS and SB-2US were already obsolete, they were the only aircraft available to the Marine Corps at the time. First Fleet, 2 ND Fleet, 5 TH Fleet, 11 TH Air Fleet During the Battle of the Coral Sea one month earlier, the Japanese light carrier SHH had been sunk and the fleet carrier Shikaku was severely damaged by three bomb hits and was in dry dock for months of repair. Although the fleet carrier Ziwikaku escaped the battle undamaged, she had lost almost half her air group, and was in port in Kure awaiting replacement planes and pilots. That there were none immediately available is attributable to the failure of the IJN crew training program, which already showed signs of being unable to replace losses. Instructors from the Yokosuka Air Corps were employed in an effort to make up the shortfall. Nagamo's Dilemma Attacks on the Japanese Fleet Japanese Counterattacks American Counterattack Historians Jonathan Parshall and Anthony Tully believe that by combining the surviving aircraft and pilots from Shikaku and Ziwikaku, it is likely that Ziwikaku could have been equipped with almost a full composite air group. They also note that doing so would have violated Japanese carrier doctrine, which stressed that carriers and their air groups must train as a single unit. In any case, the Japanese apparently made no serious attempt to get Ziwikaku ready for the forthcoming battle. Indochina, Indian Ocean Philippines 1941-42, Franco-Thai War, Thailand, Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Hong Kong, Singapore, Indochina, Malacca Strait, Jurist, Tide Race, Zipper, Strategic Bombing. Thus, Carrier Division 5, consisting of the two most advanced aircraft carriers of the Kido Butai, would not be available, which meant that Vice Admiral Nagamo had only two thirds of the fleet carriers at his disposal Kaga and Akaji forming Carrier Division 1 and Hiri and SRY as Carrier Division 2. This was partly due to fatigue. Japanese carriers had been constantly on operations since December 7, 1941, including raids on Darwin and Colombo. Nonetheless, the first carrier strike force sailed with 238 available aircraft on the four carriers 57 on Hiryu and 57 on Soryu. The main Japanese carrier-borne strike aircraft were the D-3A-1 VAL dive bomber and the B-5N-2 Kate, which was used either as a torpedo bomber or as a level bomber. The main carrier fighter was the fast and highly maneuverable A-6M-0. For a variety of reasons, production of the VAL had been drastically reduced, while that of the Kate had been stopped completely and, as a consequence, there were none available to replace losses. In addition, many of the aircraft being used during the June 1942 operations had been operational since late November 1941 and, although they were well maintained, many were almost worn out and had become increasingly unreliable. These factors meant all carriers of the Kido Butai had fewer aircraft than their normal complement, with few spare aircraft or parts stored in the carrier's hangars. In addition, Nagamo's carrier force suffered from several defensive deficiencies which gave it, in Mark P.D.S. words, a glass jaw.
it could throw a punch but couldn't take one. Japanese carrier anti-aircraft guns and associated fire control systems had several design and configuration deficiencies which limited their effectiveness. The IJN's fleet combat air patrol consisted of too few fighter aircraft and was hampered by an inadequate early warning system, including a lack of radar. Poor radio communications with the fighter aircraft inhibited effective command and control of the CAP. The carriers escorting warships were deployed as visual scouts in a ring at long range, not as close anti-aircraft escorts, as they lacked training, doctrine, and sufficient anti-aircraft guns. Burma, 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 Burma Japanese strategic scouting arrangements prior to the battle were also in disarray. A picket line of Japanese submarines was late getting into position, which let the American carriers reach their assembly point northeast of Midway without being detected. A second attempt at reconnaissance, using four-engine H-8K Emily flying boats to scout Pearl Harbor prior to the battle and detect whether the American carriers were present, part of Operation K was thwarted when Japanese submarines assigned to refuel the search aircraft discovered that the intended refueling point a hitherto deserted bay off French frigate Shoals was now occupied by American warships, because the Japanese had carried out an identical mission in March. Thus, Japan was deprived of any knowledge concerning the movements of the American carriers immediately before the battle. Japanese radio intercepts did notice an increase in both American submarine activity and message traffic. This information was in Yamamoto's hands prior to the battle. Japanese plans were not changed, Yamamoto, at sea in Yamato, assumed Nagamo had received the same signal from Tokyo, and did not communicate with him by radio, so as not to reveal his position. These messages were, contrary to earlier historical accounts, also received by Nagamo before the battle began. For reasons which remain unclear, Nagamo did not alter his plans or take additional precautions. Admiral Nimitz had one priceless advantage, U.S. crypt analysts had partially broken the Japanese Navy's JN-25B code. Since early 1942, the U.S. had been decoding messages stating that there would soon be an operation at Objective AF. It was initially not known where AF was, but Commander Joseph Rockefeller and his team at Station Hypo were able to confirm that it was Midway. Captain Wilfred Holmes devised a ruse of telling the base at Midway to broadcast an uncoded radio message stating that Midway's water purification system had broken down. Within 24 hours, the code breakers picked up a Japanese message that AF was short on water. No Japanese radio operators who intercepted the message seemed concerned that the Americans were broadcasting uncoded that a major naval installation close to the Japanese threat ring was having a water shortage, which could have tipped off Japanese intelligence officers that it was a deliberate attempt at deception. Japanese and U.S. Casualties Hypo was also able to determine the date of the attack as either 4 or June 5, and to provide Nimitz with a complete IJN order of battle. Japan had a new codebook, but its introduction had been delayed, enabling Hypo to read messages for several crucial days. The new code, which would take several days to be cracked, came into use on May 24 but the important breaks had already been made. As a result, the Americans entered the battle with a very good picture of where, when, and in what strength the Japanese would appear. Nimitz knew that the Japanese had negated their numerical advantage by dividing their ships into four separate task groups, all too widely separated to be able to support each other. This dispersal resulted in few fast ships being available to escort the carrier striking force, 
reducing the number of anti-aircraft guns protecting the carriers. Nimitz calculated that the aircraft on his three carriers, plus those on Midway Island, gave the U.S. rough parity with Yamamoto's four carriers, mainly because American carrier air groups were larger than Japanese ones. The Japanese, by contrast, remained mainly unaware of their opponents' true strength and dispositions even after the battle began. Aftermath American Prisoners Japanese Prisoners At about 9 o'clock on June 3, Ensign Jack Reed, piloting a PBY from U.S. Navy Patrol Squadron VP-44, spotted the Japanese occupation force 500 nautical miles to the west-southwest of Midway. He mistakenly reported this group as the main force. 9B-17S took off from Midway at 12.30 for the first air attack. Three hours later, they found Tanaka's transport group 570 nautical miles to the west. Under heavy anti-aircraft fire, they dropped their bombs. Although their crews reported hitting four ships, none of the bombs actually hit anything and no significant damage was inflicted. Early the following morning, the Japanese oil tanker Akabano Maru sustained the first hit when a torpedo from an attacking PBY struck her around 1 o'clock. This was the only successful air-launched torpedo attack by the U.S. during the entire battle. At 4.30 on June 4, Nagamo launched his initial attack on Midway itself, consisting of 36 Aichi D-3A dive bombers and 36 Nakajima B-5N torpedo bombers, escorted by 36 Mitsubishi A-6M-0 fighters. At the same time, he launched his eight search aircraft. Japanese reconnaissance arrangements were flimsy, with too few aircraft to adequately cover the assigned search areas, laboring under poor weather conditions to the northeast and east of the task force. As Nagamo's bombers and fighters were taking off, 11 PBYs were leaving midway to run their search patterns. At 5.34, a PBY reported sighting two Japanese carriers and another spotted the inbound airstrike ten minutes later. Midway's radar picked up the enemy at a distance of several miles, and interceptors were scrambled. Unescorted bombers headed off to attack the Japanese carriers, their fighter escorts remaining behind to defend Midway. At 6.20, Japanese carrier aircraft bombed and heavily damaged the U.S. base. Midway-based Marine fighters led by Major Floyd B. Parks, which included seven F-4Fs and 21 F-2As, intercepted the Japanese and suffered heavy losses, though they managed to destroy four B-5Ns and at least three A-6Ms. Within the first few minutes, Three F-4Fs and 13 F-2As were destroyed, while most of the surviving U.S. planes were damaged, with only two remaining airworthy. American anti-aircraft fire was intense and accurate, destroying four additional Japanese aircraft and damaging many more. Impact Of the 108 Japanese aircraft involved in this attack, 11 were destroyed. 14 were heavily damaged, and 29 were damaged to some degree. The initial Japanese attack did not succeed in neutralizing Midway, American bombers could still use the airbase to refuel and attack the Japanese invasion force, and most of Midway's land-based defenses were intact. Japanese pilots reported to Nagamo that a second aerial attack on Midway's defenses would be necessary if troops were to go ashore by June 7. Having taken off prior to the Japanese attack, American bombers based on Midway made several attacks on the Japanese carrier force. These included six Grumman Avengers, detached to Midway from Hornet SVT-8, 
Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 241, consisting of 11 SB2U3S and 16 SBDs, plus 4 USAF B26S of the 18th Reconnaissance and 69th Bomb Squadrons armed with torpedoes, and 15 B17S of the 31st, 72nd, and 431st Bomb Squadrons. The Japanese repelled these attacks, losing two fighters while destroying five TBFs, two SB2US, eight SBDs, and two B-26S. The first Marine aviator to perish in the battle, Major Lofton R. Henderson of VMSB-241, was killed while leading his inexperienced Dauntless Squadron into action. The main airfield at Guadalcanal was named after him in August 1942. One B-26, after being seriously damaged by anti-aircraft fire, made a suicide run on Akaji. Making no attempt to pull out of its run, the aircraft narrowly missed crashing directly into the carrier's bridge, which could have killed Nagamo and his command staff. This experience may well have contributed to Nagamo's determination to launch another attack on Midway, in direct violation of Yamamoto's order to keep the reserve strike force armed for anti-ship operations. In accordance with Japanese carrier doctrine at the time, Admiral Nagamo had kept half of his aircraft in reserve. These comprised two squadrons each of dive bombers and torpedo bombers. The dive bombers were as yet unarmed. The torpedo bombers were armed with torpedoes should any American warships be located. At 7.15, Nagamo ordered his reserve planes to be rearmed with contact-fused general-purpose bombs for use against land targets. This was a result of the attacks from Midway, as well as of the morning flight leader's recommendation of a second strike. Rearming had been underway for about 30 minutes when, at 7.40, the delayed scout plane from Tone signaled that it had sighted a sizable American naval force to the east, but neglected to describe its composition. Later evidence suggests Nagamo did not receive the sighting report until 8 o'clock. Nagamo quickly reversed his order to rearm the bombers with general-purpose bombs and demanded that the scout plane ascertain the composition of the American force. Another 20-40 minutes elapsed before Tone S. Scout finally radioed the presence of a single carrier in the American force. This was one of the carriers from Task Force 16. The other carrier was not sighted. Nagamo was now in a quandary. Rear Admiral Taman Yamaguchi, leading Carrier Division 2, recommended that Nagamo strike immediately with the forces at hand, 18 Aichi D3A1 dive bombers each on SRY and Hiri, and half the ready cover patrol aircraft. Nagamo's opportunity to hit the American ships was now limited by the imminent return of his midway strike force. The returning strike force needed to land promptly or it would have to ditch into the sea. Because of the constant flight deck activity associated with combat air patrol operations during the preceding hour, the Japanese never had an opportunity to position their reserve planes on the flight deck for launch. The few aircraft on the Japanese flight decks at the time of the attack were either defensive fighters or, in the case of SRY, fighters being spotted to augment the combat air patrol. Spotting his flight decks and launching aircraft would have required at least 30 minutes. Furthermore, by spotting and launching immediately, Nagamo would be committing some of his reserve to battle without proper anti-ship armament, he had just witnessed how easily unescorted American bombers had been shot down. Poor discipline caused many of the Japanese bombers to ditch their bombs and attempt to dogfight intercepting F-4FS. Japanese carrier doctrine preferred the launching of fully constituted strikes rather than piecemeal attacks.
without confirmation of whether the American force included carriers, Nagamo's reaction was doctrinaire. In addition, the arrival of another land-based American airstrike at 7.53 gave way to the need to attack the island again. In the end, Nagamo decided to wait for his first strike force to land, then launch the reserve, which would by then be properly armed with torpedoes. In the final analysis, it made no difference. Fletcher's carriers had launched their planes beginning at 7 o'clock, so the aircraft that would deliver the crushing blow were already on their way. Even if Nagamo had not strictly followed carrier doctrine, he could not have prevented the launch of the American attack. Discovery of Sunken Vessels Remembrances the Americans had already launched their carrier aircraft against the Japanese. Fletcher, in overall command aboard Yorktown, and benefiting from PBY sighting reports from the early morning, ordered Spruance to launch against the Japanese as soon as was practical, while initially holding Yorktown in reserve in case any other Japanese carriers were found. Spruance judged that, Though the range was extreme, a strike could succeed and gave the order to launch the attack. He then left Halsey's chief of staff, Captain Miles Browning, to work out the details and oversee the launch. The carriers had to launch into the wind, so the light southeasterly breeze would require them to steam away from the Japanese at high speed. Browning therefore suggested a launch time of 7 o'clock giving the carriers an hour to close on the Japanese at 25 knots. This would place them at about 155 nautical miles from the Japanese fleet, assuming it did not change course. The first plane took off from Spruance's carrier's Enterprise and Hornet a few minutes after 7 o'clock. Fletcher, upon completing his own scouting flights, followed suit at 8 o'clock from Yorktown. Fletcher, along with Yorktown's commanding officer, Captain Elliot Buckmaster, and their staffs, had acquired first-hand experience in organizing and launching a full strike against an enemy force in the Coral Sea, but there was no time to pass these lessons on to Enterprise and Hornet which were tasked with launching the first strike. Spruance ordered the striking aircraft to proceed to target immediately, rather than waste time waiting for the strike force to assemble, since neutralizing enemy carriers was the key to the survival of his own task force. Footnotes Notes While the Japanese were able to launch 108 aircraft in just seven minutes, it took Enterprise and Hornet over an hour to launch 117. Spruance judged that the need to throw something at the enemy as soon as possible was greater than the need to coordinate the attack by aircraft of different types and speeds. Accordingly, American squadrons were launched piecemeal and proceeded to the target in several different groups. It was accepted that the lack of coordination would diminish the impact of the American attacks and increase their casualties, but Spruance calculated that this was worthwhile, since keeping the Japanese under aerial attack impaired their ability to launch a counter-strike, and he gambled that he would find Nagamo with his flight decks at their most vulnerable. American carrier aircraft had difficulty locating the target, despite the positions they had been given. The strike from Hornet, led by Commander Stanhope C. Ring, followed an incorrect heading of 265 degrees rather than the 240 degrees indicated by the contact report. As a result, Air Group 8's dive bombers missed the Japanese carriers. Torpedo Squadron 8, led by Lieutenant Commander John C. Waldron, broke formation from ring and followed the correct heading. The 10F4FS from Hornet ran out of fuel and had to ditch. <laughs>
Waldron's squadron sighted the enemy carriers and began attacking at 9.20, followed by Torpedo Squadron 6 whose Wildcat fighter escorts also ran low on fuel and had to turn back at 9.40. Without fighter escort, all 15 TBD devastators of VT-8 were shot down without being able to inflict any damage. Ensign George H. Gay, Jr. was the only survivor of the 30 aircrew of VT-8. VT-6 lost 10 of its 14 devastators, and 10 of Yorktown's VT-3's 12 devastators were shot down with no hits to show for their effort thanks in part to the abysmal performance of their unimproved Mark 13 torpedoes. Midway was the last time the TBD Devastator was used in combat. The Japanese Combat Air Patrol, flying Mitsubishi A6M20s, made short work of the unescorted, slow, underarmed TBDs. A few TBDs managed to get within a few ship lengths range of their targets before dropping their torpedoes close enough to be able to strafe the enemy ships and force the Japanese carriers to make sharp evasive maneuvers but all of their torpedoes either missed or failed to explode. Remarkably, senior Navy and Bureau of Ordnance officers never questioned why half a dozen torpedoes, released so close to the Japanese carriers, produced no results. The abysmal performance of American torpedoes in the early months of the war became a scandal. Torpedo after torpedo either missed by running directly under the target, prematurely exploded, or struck targets with textbook right-angle hits and failed to explode. Despite their failure to score any hits, the American torpedo attacks achieved three important results. First, they kept the Japanese carriers off balance and unable to prepare and launch their own counter-strike. Second, the poor control of the Japanese combat air patrol meant they were out of position for subsequent attacks. Third, many of the Zeros ran low on ammunition and fuel. The appearance of a third torpedo plane attack from the southeast by VT-3 from Yorktown at 10 o'clock very quickly drew the majority of the Japanese cap to the southeast quadrant of the fleet. Better discipline, and the employment of a greater number of zeros for the cap might have enabled Nagamo to prevent the damage caused by the coming American attacks. By chance, at the same time VT-3 was sighted by the Japanese. Three squadrons of SBDs from Enterprise and Yorktown were approaching from the southwest and northeast. The Yorktown squadron had flown just behind VT-3, but elected to attack from a different course. The two squadrons from Enterprise were running low on fuel because of the time spent looking for the enemy. Squadron Commander C. Wade McCluskey, Jr. decided to continue the search and by good fortune spotted the wake of the Japanese destroyer Arashi, steaming at full speed to rejoin Nagamo's carriers after having unsuccessfully depth-charged U.S. submarine Nautilus, which had unsuccessfully attacked the battleship Kirishima. Some bombers were lost from fuel exhaustion before the attack commenced. McCluskey's decision to continue the search and his judgment, in the opinion of Admiral Chester Nimitz, decided the fate of our carrier task force and our forces at Midway. All three American dive bomber squadrons arrived almost simultaneously at the perfect time, locations, and altitudes to attack. Most of the Japanese cap was focusing on the torpedo planes of VT-3 and were out of position, armed Japanese strike aircraft filled the hangar decks, Fuel hoses snaked across the decks as refueling operations were hastily being completed, and the repeated change of ordnance meant that bombs and torpedoes were stacked around the hangars, rather than stowed safely in the magazines, making the Japanese carriers extraordinarily vulnerable. Beginning at 
the two squadrons of Enterprise S Air Group split up with the intention of sending one squadron each to attack Kaga and Akaji. A miscommunication caused both of the squadrons to dive at the Kaga. Recognizing the error, Lt. Commander Richard Halsey Best and his two wingmen were able to pull out of their dives and, after judging that Kaga was doomed, headed north to attack Akaji. Coming under an onslaught of bombs from almost two full squadrons, Kaga sustained four or five direct hits, which caused heavy damage and started multiple fires. One of the bombs landed near the bridge, killing Captain Jisaku Akita and most of the ship's senior officers. Lt. Clarence E. Dickinson, part of McCluskey's group, recalled. We were coming down in all directions on the port side of the carrier. I recognized her as the Kaga, and she was enormous. The target was utterly satisfying. I saw a bomb hit just behind where I was aiming. I saw the deck rippling and curling back in all directions exposing a great section of the hangar below. I saw a 500-pound bomb hit right abreast of the island. The two 100-pound bombs struck in the forward area of the parked planes. Several minutes later, Best and his two wingmen dived on the Akaji. Mitsuo Fuita, the Japanese aviator who had led the attack on Pearl Harbor, was on the Akaji when it was hit, and described the attack. A lookout screamed, Hell Divers! I looked up to see three black enemy planes plummeting towards our ship. Some of our machine guns managed to fire a few frantic bursts at them, but it was too late. The plump silhouettes of the American Dauntless dive bombers quickly grew larger, and then a number of black objects suddenly floated eerily from their wings. Although Akaji sustained only one direct hit, it proved to be a fatal blow. The bomb struck the edge of the midship deck elevator and penetrated to the upper hangar deck, where it exploded among the armed and fueled aircraft in the vicinity. Nagamo's chief of staff, Rinashuk Kyuzaka, recorded a terrific fire, bodies all over the place. Planes stood tail up, belching livid flames and jet black smoke, making it impossible to bring the fires under control. Another bomb exploded underwater very close astern, the resulting geyser bent the flight deck upward in grotesque configurations and caused crucial rudder damage. Simultaneously, Yorktown SVB-3, commanded by Max Leslie, went for SRY, scoring at least three hits and causing extensive damage. Some of Leslie's bombers did not have bombs as they were accidentally released when the pilots attempted to use electrical arming switches. Nevertheless, Leslie and others still dove, strafing carrier decks and providing cover for those who had bombs. Gasoline ignited, creating an inferno, while stacked bombs and ammunition detonated. VT-3 targeted Hiri which was hemmed in by SRY, Kaga, and Akaji, but achieved no hits. Within six minutes, SRY and Kaga were ablaze from stem to stern, as fires spread through the ships. Akaji, having been struck by only one bomb, took longer to burn, but the resulting fires quickly expanded and soon proved impossible to extinguish. She too was eventually consumed by flames and had to be abandoned. All three carriers remained temporarily afloat, as none had suffered damage below the waterline, other than the rudder damage to Akaji caused by the near-miss close astern. Despite initial hopes that Akaji could be saved or at least towed back to Japan, all three carriers were eventually abandoned and scuttled. Hiri the sole surviving Japanese aircraft carrier, wasted little time in counter-attacking. Hiri's first attack wave, 
consisting of 18 D-3AS and 6 fighter escorts, followed the retreating American aircraft and attacked the first carrier they encountered, Yorktown, hitting her with three bombs, which blew a hole in the deck, snuffed out her boilers, and destroyed one anti-aircraft mount. The damage also forced Admiral Fletcher to move his command staff to the heavy cruiser Astoria. Repair teams were able to temporarily patch the flight deck and restore power to several boilers within an hour, giving her a speed of 19 knots and enabling her to resume air operations. Thirteen Japanese dive bombers and three escorting fighters were lost in this attack. Approximately one hour later, Hiri's second attack wave, consisting of 10 B-5NS and 6 escorting A-6MS, arrived over Yorktown, the repair efforts had been so effective that the Japanese pilots assumed that Yorktown must be a different, undamaged carrier. They attacked, crippling Yorktown with two torpedoes, she lost all power and developed a 23-degree list to port. Five torpedo bombers and two fighters were shot down in this attack. News of the two strikes, with the mistaken reports that each had sunk an American carrier, greatly improved Japanese morale. The few surviving aircraft were all recovered aboard Hiri. Despite the heavy losses, the Japanese believed that they could scrape together enough aircraft for one more strike against what they believed to be the only remaining American carrier. Late in the afternoon, a Yorktown scout aircraft located Hiri, prompting Enterprise to launch a final strike of 24 dive bombers. Despite Hiri being defended by a strong cover of more than a dozen Zero fighters, the attack by Enterprise and orphaned Yorktown aircraft launched from Enterprise was successful, four bombs hit Hiri, leaving her ablaze and unable to operate aircraft. Hornet S strike, launched late because of a communications error, concentrated on the remaining escort ships, but failed to score any hits. After futile attempts at controlling the blaze, most of the crew remaining on Hiri were evacuated and the remainder of the fleet continued sailing northeast in an attempt to intercept the American carriers. Despite a scuttling attempt by a Japanese destroyer that hit her with a torpedo and then departed quickly, Hiri stayed afloat for several more hours, being discovered early the next morning by an aircraft from the escort carrier HSH and prompting hopes she could be saved or at least towed back to Japan. Soon after being spotted, Hiri sank. Rear Admiral Taman Yamaguchi, together with the ship's captain, Tomio Keiku, chose to go down with the ship, costing Japan perhaps its best carrier officer. As darkness fell, both sides took stock and made tentative plans for continuing the action. Admiral Fletcher, obliged to abandon the derelict Yorktown and feeling he could not adequately command from a cruiser, ceded operational command to Spruance. Spruance knew the United States had won a great victory, but he was still unsure of what Japanese forces remained and was determined to safeguard both Midway and his carriers. To aid his aviators, who had launched at extreme range, he had continued to close with Nagamo during the day and persisted as night fell. Finally, fearing a possible night encounter with Japanese surface forces, and believing Yamamoto still intended to invade, based in part on a misleading contact report from the submarine Tambower, Spruance changed course and withdrew to the east, turning back west towards the enemy at midnight. For his part, Yamamoto initially decided to continue the engagement and sent his remaining surface forces searching eastward for the American carriers. Simultaneously, he detached a cruiser raiding force to bombard the island. The Japanese surface forces failed to make contact with the Americans because Spruance had decided to briefly withdraw eastward, 
and Yamamoto ordered a general withdrawal to the west. It was fortunate Spruance did not pursue, for had he come in contact with Yamamoto's heavy ships, including Yamato, in the dark and considering the Japanese Navy's superiority in night attack tactics at the time, there is a very high probability his cruisers would have been overwhelmed and his carriers sunk. Spruance failed to regain contact with Yamamoto's forces on June 5, despite extensive searches. Towards the end of the day he launched a search-and-destroy mission to seek out any remnants of Nagamo's carrier force. This late afternoon strike narrowly missed detecting Yamamoto's main body and failed to score hits on a straggling Japanese destroyer. The strike planes returned to the carriers after nightfall, prompting Spruance to order Enterprise and Hornet to turn on their lights to aid the landings. At 2.15 on the night of 5 6 June, Commander John Murphy's Timboer, lying 90 nautical miles west of Midway, made the second of the submarine force's two major contributions to the battle's outcome, although its impact was heavily blunted by Murphy himself. Citing several ships, neither Murphy nor his executive officer, Edward Spruance, could identify them. Uncertain of whether they were friendly or not and unwilling to approach any closer to verify their heading or type, Murphy decided to send a vague report of four large ships to Admiral Robert English, Commander, Submarine Force, Pacific Fleet. This report was passed on by English to Nimitz, who then sent it to Spruance. Spruance, a former submarine commander, was understandably furious at the vagueness of Murphy's report, as it provided him with little more than suspicion and no concrete information on which to make his preparations. Unaware of the exact location of Yamamoto's main body, Spruance was forced to assume the four large ships reported by Tambo represented the main invasion force and so he moved to block it while staying 100 nautical miles northeast of Midway. In reality, the ships sighted by Tamboer were the detachment of four cruisers and two destroyers Yamamoto had sent to bombard Midway. At 2.55, these ships received Yamamoto's order to retire and changed course to comply. At about the same time as this change of course, Tamboer was sighted and during maneuvers designed to avoid a submarine attack, the heavy cruisers Megami and Mikuma collided, inflicting serious damage on Megami S. Bao. The less severely damaged Mikuma slowed to 12 knots to keep pace. Only at 4.12 did the sky brighten enough for Murphy to be certain the ships were Japanese by which time staying surfaced was hazardous and he dived to approach for an attack. The attack was unsuccessful and at around 6 o'clock he finally reported two westbound Megami-class cruisers, before diving again and playing no further role in the battle. Limping along on a straight course at 12 knots roughly one-third their top speed Megami and Mikuma had been almost perfect targets for a submarine attack. As soon as Tamboa returned to port, Spruance had Murphy relieved of duty and reassigned to a shore station, citing his confusing contact report, poor torpedo shooting during his attack run, and general lack of aggression, especially as compared to Nautilus, the oldest of the twelve boats at Midway and the only one which had successfully placed a torpedo on target. Over the following two days, Several strikes were launched against the stragglers, first from Midway, then from Spruance's carriers. Mikuma was eventually sunk by Dauntless, while Megami survived further severe damage to return home for repairs. The destroyers Irashio and Asashio were also bombed and strafed during the last of these attacks. Captain Richard E. Fleming, a U.S. Marine Corps aviator, was killed while executing a glide bomb run on Mikuma and was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Meanwhile, 
salvage efforts on Yorktown were encouraging, and she was taken in tow by USS Vireo. In the late afternoon of June 6, the Japanese submarine I-168, which had managed to slip through the cordon of destroyers, fired a salvo of torpedoes, two of which struck Yorktown. There were few casualties aboard, since most of the crew had already been evacuated, but a third torpedo from this salvo struck the destroyer USS Hammond, which had been providing auxiliary power to Yorktown. Hammond broke in two and sank with the loss of 80 lives, mostly because her own depth charges exploded. With further salvage efforts deemed hopeless, the remaining repair crews were evacuated from Yorktown, which sank just after 5 o'clock on June 7. By the time the battle ended, 3,057 Japanese had died. Casualties aboard the four carriers were, Akaji, 267, Kaga, 811, Hiryu, 392, Soryu, 711, a total of 2,181. The heavy cruisers Mikuma and Megami accounted for another 792 deaths. In addition, the destroyers Irashio and Asashio were both damaged during the air attacks which sank Mikuma and caused further damage to Megami. Float planes were lost from the cruisers Chikuma and Tone. Dead aboard the destroyers Tanikaze, Arashi, Kazegamo, and the fleet oiler Akabano Maru made up the remaining 23 casualties. At the end of the battle, the U.S. lost the carrier Yorktown and a destroyer. 307 Americans had been killed, including Major General Clarence L. Tinker, Commander, 7th Air Force who personally led a bomber strike from Hawaii against the retreating Japanese forces on June 7. He was killed when his aircraft crashed near Midway Island. After winning a clear victory, and as pursuit became too hazardous near Wake, American forces retired. Spruance once again withdrew to the east to refuel his destroyers and rendezvous with the carrier Saratoga which was ferrying much-needed replacement aircraft. Fletcher transferred his flag to Saratoga on the afternoon of June 8 and resumed command of the carrier force. For the remainder of that day and then June 9, Fletcher continued to launch search missions from the three carriers to ensure the Japanese were no longer advancing on Midway. Late on June 10 a decision was made to leave the area and the American carriers eventually returned to Pearl Harbor. Historian Samuel E. Morrison noted in 1949 that Spruance was subjected to much criticism for not pursuing the retreating Japanese, thus allowing their surface fleet to escape. Clay Blair argued in 1975 that had Spruance pressed on, he would have been unable to launch his aircraft after nightfall, and his cruisers would have been overwhelmed by Yamamoto's powerful surface units, including Yamato. Furthermore, the American air groups had suffered considerable losses, including most of their torpedo bombers. This made it unlikely that they would be effective in an airstrike against the Japanese battleships, even if they had managed to catch them during daytime. Also, by this time Spruance's destroyers were critically low on fuel. On June 10, the Imperial Japanese Navy conveyed to the Military Liaison Conference an incomplete picture of the results of the battle. Shishi Nagamo's detailed battle report was submitted to the High Command on June 15. It was intended only for the highest echelons in the Japanese Navy and government, and was guarded closely throughout the war. In it, one of the more striking revelations is the comment on the mobile force commander's estimates, the enemy is not aware of our plans. In reality, the whole operation had been compromised from the beginning by Allied code-breaking efforts.
the Japanese public and much of the military command structure were kept in the dark about the extent of the defeat, Japanese news announced a great victory. Only Emperor Hirohito and the highest Navy command personnel were accurately informed of the carrier and pilot losses. Consequently, even the Imperial Japanese Army continued to believe, for at least a short time, that the fleet was in good condition. On the return of the Japanese fleet to Hashirahima on June 14 the wounded were immediately transferred to naval hospitals, most were classified as secret patients, placed in isolation wards and quarantined from other patients and their own families to keep this major defeat secret. The remaining officers and men were quickly dispersed to other units of the fleet and, without being allowed to see family or friends, were shipped to units in the South Pacific, where the majority died in battle. None of the flag officers or staff of the combined fleet were penalized, with Nagamo later being placed in command of the rebuilt carrier force. As a result of the defeat, new procedures were adopted whereby more Japanese aircraft were refueled and rearmed on the flight deck, rather than in the hangars, and the practice of draining all unused fuel lines was adopted. The new carriers being built were redesigned to incorporate only two flight deck elevators and new firefighting equipment. More carrier crew members were trained in damage control and firefighting techniques, although the losses later in the war of Shikaku, he and especially Tay suggest that there were still problems in this area. Replacement pilots were pushed through an abbreviated training regimen in order to meet the short-term needs of the fleet. This led to a sharp decline in the quality of the aviators produced. These inexperienced pilots were fed into front-line units, while the veterans who remained after Midway and the Solomons campaign were forced to share an increased workload as conditions grew more desperate with few being given a chance to rest in rear areas or in the home islands. As a result, Japanese naval air groups as a whole progressively deteriorated during the war while their American adversaries continued to improve. Three U.S. airmen, Ensign Wesley Osmus, a pilot from Yorktown, Ensign Frank O'Flaherty, a pilot from Enterprise, and aviation machinists mate B.F. Bruno Gado, the radio man gunner of O'Flaherty's SBD, were captured by the Japanese during the battle. Osmus was held on Arashi, O'Flaherty and Gado on the cruiser Nagara, all three were interrogated, and then killed by being tied to water-filled kerosene cans and thrown overboard to drown. The report filed by Nagamo tersely states of Ensign Osmus, he died on June 6 and was buried at sea, O'Flaherty and Gato's fates were not mentioned in Nagamo's report. The execution of Ensign Wesley Osmus in this manner was apparently ordered by Arashi's captain, Watanabe Yazumasa. Two enlisted men from Mikuma were rescued from a life raft on June 9 by USS Trout and brought to Pearl Harbor. After receiving medical care, at least one of these sailors cooperated during interrogation and provided intelligence. Another 35 crewmen from Hiria were taken from a lifeboat by USS Ballard on June 19 after being spotted by an American search plane. They were brought to Midway and then transferred to Pearl Harbor on USS Sirius. Fuita's flight engineer Kazuo Kanigazaka was among the prisoners, and his experience as a POW influenced Fuita to become a Christian after the war. The Battle of Midway has often been called the turning point of the Pacific. It was the Allies' first major naval victory against the Japanese one despite the Japanese Navy having more forces and experience than its American counterpart. Had Japan won the battle as thoroughly as the U.S. did, it might have been able to conquer Midway Island. Saratoga would have been the only American carrier in the Pacific, 
with no new ones being completed before the end of 1942. While the U.S. would probably not have sought peace with Japan as Yamamoto hoped, his country might have revived Operation FS to invade and occupy Fiji and Samoa, attacked Australia, Alaska, and Ceylon, or even attempted to conquer Hawaii. Although the Japanese continued to try to secure more territory, and the U.S. did not move from a state of naval parity to one of supremacy until after several more months of hard combat, Midway allowed the Allies to switch to the strategic initiative, paving the way for the landings on Guadalcanal and the prolonged attrition of the Solomon Islands campaign. Midway allowed this to occur before the first of the new Essex-class fleet carriers became available at the end of 1942. The Guadalcanal campaign is also regarded by some as a turning point in the Pacific War. Some authors have stated that heavy losses in carriers and veteran air crews at Midway permanently weakened the Imperial Japanese Navy. Parshal and Tully have stated that the heavy losses in veteran air crew were not crippling to the Japanese Naval Air Corps as a whole. The Japanese Navy had 2,000 carrier qualified air crew at the start of the Pacific War. The loss of four large fleet carriers and over 40% of the carrier's highly trained aircraft mechanics and technicians, plus the essential flight deck crews and armorers, and the loss of organizational knowledge embodied in such highly trained crews, were still heavy blows to the Japanese carrier fleet. A few months after Midway, the JNAF sustained similar casualty rates in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons and Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, and it was these battles, combined with the constant attrition of veterans during the Solomons campaign, which were the catalyst for the sharp downward spiral in operational capability. After the battle, Shikaku and Ziwikaku were the only large carriers of the original Pearl Harbor strike force left for offensive actions. Of Japan's other carriers, Te, which was not commissioned until early 1944, would be the only fleet carrier worth teaming with Shikaku and Ziwikaku. RYJ and Ziwi were light carriers, while Junwai and He, although technically classified as fleet carriers, were second-rate ships of comparatively limited effectiveness. In the time it took Japan to build three carriers, the U.S. Navy commissioned more than two dozen fleet and light fleet carriers, and numerous escort carriers. By 1942 the United States was already three years into a shipbuilding program mandated by the Second Vincent Act intended to make the Navy larger than all the Axis navies combined, plus the British and French navies, which it was feared might fall into Axis hands. Both the United States and Japan accelerated the training of aircrew, but the United States had a more effective pilot rotation system, which meant that more veterans survived and went on to training or command billets where they were able to pass on lessons they had learned in training, instead of remaining in combat, where errors were more likely to be fatal. By the time of the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June 1944, the Japanese had nearly rebuilt their carrier forces in terms of numbers, but their planes, many of which were obsolescent, were largely flown by inexperienced and poorly trained pilots. Midway showed the worth of pre-war naval cryptanalysis and intelligence gathering. These efforts continued and were expanded throughout the war in both the Pacific and Atlantic theaters. Successes were numerous and significant. For instance, cryptanalysis made possible the shooting down of Admiral Yamamoto's airplane in 1943. The Battle of Midway redefined the central importance of air superiority for the remainder of the war when the Japanese suddenly lost their four main aircraft carriers and were forced to return home. Without any form of air superiority, the Japanese never again launched a major offensive in the Pacific. <laughs>
Because of the extreme depth of the ocean in the area of the battle, researching the battlefield has presented extraordinary difficulties. On May 19, 1998, Robert Ballard and a team of scientists and Midway veterans from both sides located and photographed Yorktown. The ship was remarkably intact for a vessel that had sunk in 1942, much of the original equipment and even the original paint scheme were still visible. Ballard's subsequent search for the Japanese carriers was unsuccessful. In September 1999, a joint expedition between Nautico's Corp. and the U.S. Naval Oceanographic Office searched for the Japanese aircraft carriers. Using advanced re-navigation techniques in conjunction with the ship's log of the submarine USS Nautilus, the expedition located a large piece of wreckage, subsequently identified as having come from the upper hangar deck of Kaga. The main wreck of Kaga has yet to be located. Chicago Municipal Airport, important to the war effort in World War II, was renamed Chicago Midway International Airport in 1949 in honor of the battle. Waldron Field, an outlying training landing strip at Corpus Christi NAS, as well as Waldron Road leading to the strip, was named in honor of John C. Waldron the commander of USS Hornet S Torpedo Squadron 8. Yorktown Boulevard leading away from the Strip was named for the U.S. carrier sunk in the battle. Henderson Field was named in honor of United States Marine Corps Major Lofton Henderson, who was the first Marine aviator to perish during the battle. An escort carrier USS Midway was commissioned on August 17, 1943. She was renamed St. Low on October 10, 1944 to clear the name Midway for a large fleet aircraft carrier, USS Midway, which was commissioned on September 10, 1945, eight days after the Japanese surrender, and is now docked in San Diego, California as the USS Midway Museum. On September 13, 2000, Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt designated the lands and waters of Midway Atoll National Wildlife Refuge as the Battle of Midway National Memorial. Dutch East Indies 1941-42, Portuguese Timor, Australia, New Guinea Philippines 1944-45, Borneo 1945 Attack on Pearl Harbor, Elwood, K. Aleutian Islands, Estevan Point Lighthouse, Fort Stevens, Lookout Air Raids, Fire Balloon, Project Hula, PX Air Raids, Mariana Islands, Volcano and Ryukyu is Tokyo, Starvation, Naval Bombardments, Yokosuka, Sagami Bay, Kure, Downfall, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Kuriles, Karafuto, Japanese Surrender. Kantokun, Manchuria, Mudanjiang, Sakhalin Island, Kuril Islands, Shumshu.